Okay, in this chapter, uh, we'll go over uh, pregnancy, growth, and development. Okay, and after uh, a pregnancy, obviously you'll have a new human uh, that is born, which will you know, grow and develop, then age, and eventually you know, die. Uh, and growth, uh, the formal definition, an increase in size due to mitosis. Remember, we all start off as one single-celled zygote, and from there you need to have a large amount of growth before you get to a a normal sized uh, baby born and then uh, the development this is a continuous process by which a person will go from one life phase to another and it's broken down into two very broad uh, general phases the prenatal and postnatal period for prenatal period this is from a moment of fertilization until you're born and then postnatal is from when you're born to when you die and hopefully the postnatal period is a fairly long one. All right, uh, we'll talk about fertilization. Uh, of the hundreds of millions of sperm cells that are ejaculated from the male, only a few hundred will actually make it to the secondary oocyte, and only those hundred or so will have a chance at fertilizing that egg. And that union of that secondary oocyte and the sperm cell is called uh, conception or fertilization. Those terms mean the same thing. And fertilization will occur in the fallopian tube, not in the uterus, but actually in the fallopian tube. All right, uh, this image we used uh, before in a previous lecture, and the follicle here ovulating in the secondary oocyte, and then the egg will actually kind of move down this way, and sperm cell will enter through here, and the two will meet usually right about here for fertilization, right in the ampulla of the fallopian tube. All right, there have to be several hundred sperm cells uh, to be present at the secondary oocyte in order for one to actually make it through the complete fertilization. And if you remember the structure of a sperm cell, they have a little uh, cap on the very end of their uh, the headpiece called a uh, ac acrosome. And in this acrosomes, you have digestive enzymes that will break through the outer layer of the egg. So you can think of one sperm cell as almost like a little Pac-Man, each of them eating, a, eating away a little bit at a time. So finally, one is able to break all the way through. And once that one sperm cell enters an egg and you have fertilization, the oocyte will harden and form an envelope around the outer ring so no other sperm cells can get in. Okay, and as that sperm nucleus uh, enters, that secondary oocyte will complete meiosis too. Uh, of course, will produce a, uh, a tiny polar body and an egg nucleus. And this uh, union of the sperm nucleus and egg nucleus is where you have the zygote. This is how we all start off in life. One single-celled structure, the zygote. Okay, here's an image of how all this would look. You have multiple uh, sperm cells going after one egg cell, and each one will eat away a little bit at a time until finally one of these gets all the way through to the nucleus. And here's an uh, electron microscope image of uh, a sea urchin sperm and egg, but it works the same way for humans. You know, one large egg cell here and several uh, sperm cells going after it. Hopefully one will get through. All right, next we'll talk about uh, pregnancy. Uh, it's the presence of a developing offspring within the uterus. Uh, each pregnancy will have three trimesters. Each one is roughly three months long. Uh, and this prenatal period will last around 38 weeks uh, from conception and pregnancy is divided into three uh, periods. You have a period of cleavage, an embryonic stage, and a fetal stage. And I'll mention something here. An embryo and a fetus are not the same thing. They are different in how they are developed, and how further along they are. So sometimes people use them interchangeably like they mean the same thing, and they're not the same thing at all. So you have an embryo first, and then the fetus. All right, we'll begin with the uh, period of cleavage. Once you have the uh, egg fertilized and you have the zygote, the very first few days, the very first divisions of that cell happen very, very quickly, but you're producing uh, cells, daughter cells, that are going to be actually smaller than the original zygote. And that's because that fallopian tube isn't all that big. You can't have that zygote getting larger in size because it would eventually rupture the fallopian tube, which would be you know, very, very dangerous for the woman. So the, the first divisions happen very quickly, but you're producing cells that are actually smaller than the original. And that 
very rapid division producing smaller cells, what's called cleavage. And the cells that are produced in this period are called blastomeres. Okay, here's how it looks. You know, the original zygote here, you know, one becoming two, and two becoming, looks like, at least eight, but no bigger in size than the original, original zygote. They have to get smaller, smaller, at least for the first few days. Of course, that obviously will change, but as it moves its way down the fallopian tube and into the uterus, the first divisions have to be uh, smaller. All right. As this mass of cells will move down the fallopian tube uh, toward the uterus, this takes about three days. Uh, at this point, uh, the structure is now a hollow, I'm sorry, it's a, a solid ball of about 16 to 32 cells. It's called a morula. And this morula will continue to divide within the uterus for another three to four days. At this point, we will form a hollow structure called a blastocyst. So morula is uh, the first step, and it's a solid ball, a solid mass. Then the morula will become hollow as the inner part starts to fill with fluid. That's called a blastocyst. All right, this blastocyst will uh, superficially implant itself on the inner lining of the uterus, the endometrium. And within this blastocyst, in the inner part, it's called the inner cell mass. This is what will eventually become the embryo and eventually the baby. And the cells that form the outer wall of the blastocyst form what's called the trophoblast. And remember, troph uh, from Latin means to feed. So these are the structures that will uh, develop to assist the embryo, eventually the placenta. All right, the blastocyst will now slowly sink into the uterine lining, and this process is called implantation. It actually will invade the endometrial lining. And after this happens, uh, the trophoblast will secrete a hormone called HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. This is the hormone that is tested for with uh, pregnancy tests, both for urine and in blood. The only reason a woman makes this hormone is when they are pregnant. And some current research will show that this hormone can actually be found in males with uh, testicular cancer. But there's no other reason why this hormone is made in a woman, in particular, unless she is pregnant. Our ACG will help to maintain the very early pregnancy because you need to have a lot of things going on all at once to help nurture this growing zygote. And it also is, uh, ACG is also secreted by the developing placenta. Now the placenta actually anchors the embryo to the uterus. And this is where the exchange of you know, waste and nutrients and gases between the embryo and the mother's blood occur. The placenta is not the same as the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord attaches to the placenta. So they are two different things. Okay. And here's a summary of the last few slides. You have fertilization right about here. And you get the moila right about here. And as you get toward the inside of the uterus, you form the blastocyst. And now this image, this light blue, this Carolina blue portion here and here, that is the inner cell mass. This is what will become the embryo and then develop into the fetus and then the baby. These are images uh, from the book. Now, the whole thing is a blastocyst, this blue part, the inner cell mass. The trophoblast is the outer lining here. It will actually invade the endometrium, the implantation. And here's how one actually looks. The trophoblast being the outer ring, endometrial lining here, and that's what will become baby, the inner cell mass. Here, this whole layer from here down is endometrium. Uh, this is the lumen or the space within the uterus. And this darkened circle here is one blastocyst. And this portion right here is the inner cell mass. That's what will develop into the baby. So this is when you have implantation. It's already invaded all the way through the endometrial lining, or at least the, the beginning part of the lining. All right, next we'll talk about hormonal changes during pregnancy. And as any woman uh, who's been pregnant can pre been pregnant can tell you, there are several changes hormonally during uh, the stage. Uh, the secretion of HCG will actually inhibit uh, FSH, LH, and this is done to prevent a normal reproductive cycle. If these continue at their normal levels, like any other day, the woman will continue to have a menstrual cycle and will actually lose that fertilized egg with the normal uh, bleeding each month. So FSH and LH need to be turned off 
so that zygote can continue to develop and grow. Uh, the placenta will secrete a large amounts of estrogens and progesterone to help stimulate and to develop the inner lining of the endometrium. Uh, again, inhibit LH and FSH. Uh, inhibit uterine contractions because you don't want the uterus to contract because that would potentially jar loose the, uh, the blastocyst and actually lose the fertilized egg and also to enlarge the reproductive organs. And the hormone uh, placental lactogen will help stimulate the breast development. And don't confuse this with uh, prolactin. Prolactin will help encourage the production of milk, but placental lactogen will increase the development of the breast tissue itself. Okay, here's a, a summary, a brief summary of HCG production and estrogen and progesterone. Very large spike of S or HCG in the beginning, but that will taper off after the first, say, two and a half months, and the estrogen and the progesterone kind of take off from there. All right, next we'll move on to the embryonic stage. This period begins from the end of the second week through the end of the eighth week. As this, or in the stage, the placenta will form, uh, the internal organs will develop, and the major external body stru uh, structures will appear. All right. uh, also within a stage, a second layer of cells that lines the trophoblast will form. And this is called the chorion. And as the placenta is forming from the chorion, another membrane develops directly around the embryo. This is the amnion. Now, it's this amnion that will get filled with uh, a fluid, the amniotic fluid, which will allow the embryo to grow and be able to move around without being compressed by other tissues. This is the uh, the fluid and the membrane that ruptures when a woman's water breaks. So a baby will sit in the amniotic sac filled with amniotic fluid, and then when it's time for uh, labor to begin, this amniotic sac will rupture, and the fluid that comes out is the amniotic fluid. And when that happens, that means the baby is coming fairly soon. So you can't stop labor at this point. Uh, by the end of the second week, an embryo has formed three very distinct uh, tissue layers. They're called germ layers, and they're called uh, the ectoderm, uh, the outermost one, mesoderm for the middle, and the endoderm, the innermost. And these tissues are where all of our organs are going to be developed. And we won't get into what organ or what tissue layer comes from, from which, but know that these three are the germ layers. And at this point, when you form these three layers, it's now called a gastrula. Because forming these three layers is called gastrulation. All right, uh, this table is taken uh, directly from textbook. Kind of summarizes the order of events and the principal events of each stage. The zygote, the first 12 to 24 hours after ovulation and fertilization. And cleavage is first. And from cleavage, you get the moila, which is that solid mass of cells. Blastocyst, which is a hollow ball of cells, and then end up with a gastrula, which is a uh, a three tissue layered structure. Alright, uh, some structures uh, found in the embryonic stage. Uh, the yolk sac, this will form uh, the blood cells very early on in the development. And this will give rise to the cells that will become the sex cells. Uh, the allantois, this will give rise to the uh, umbilical arteries and umbilical vein. And of course the umbilical cord, the structure that connects the developing embryo to the placenta. The umbilical cord is what attaches to the belly button. That's why you have that mark on the belly button. It goes from the belly button of the baby to the placenta. Okay. Uh, an image also from the textbook. And if you look at these images, you know, they show consecutive uh, levels of development. Everything is color coordinated. So everything that is you know, this yellow color here on this page will be the same thing on consecutive other pages. So here you have the you know, developing placenta here. You know, amniotic cavity here. Develop the amniotic fluid. The, the yolk sac here, uh, allantois here, but will eventually become the umbilical cord here. Of course, the chorion on the outermost side. This is a little bit later on development, and the baby is a little bit more defined. Of course, the amniotic fluid, and the amniotic sac. The chorion plus the endometrium forms the placenta. That's how the uh, placenta is anchored into the uterine lining. Uh, the next several uh, pictures will go over how the embryo looks in various dates, or approximate dates of development. This will give you an idea of how things 
know, develop over time. Uh, this first one is around 35 days, you know, give or take one day. You can see the, the tail is still there. This will become the lower legs, uh, of course the arms, the maxillary and the mandibular processes. Maxillary is the top part of your mouth. Uh, mandible is the lower jaw, so the mouth will be right here. Uh, fast forward a few more days, you know, the poor brain is up here. You know, of course, tail, tail is still there. The elbows start to form. Uh, the ears are starting to develop here. Uh, day 40 or uh, 41, uh, the pigmented eye starts to develop. Uh, the heart prominence actually sticks out a little bit more. Uh, the rest becomes more defined. Uh, the external acoustic meatus, the hole in the side of the skull that leads to the ear or the inner ear. I uh, see the toe rays are becoming a little bit more defined here at day 45, 46. Same thing with the notches between the, the fingers. They're still webbed, but you can see how there are individualized notches. As day 49 or 50, this is an illustration of one. This is how a real embryo looks at day 49 or 50. The eyelid here, you know, the ear starts to be discernible. You know, of course, the fingers are still webbed. Same thing with the toes. But that's illustration, and that's real. Okay. Day 52, uh, 53, the fingers start to separate. The toes are still going to be webbed for a while, but the fingers are separated here, and the toes will separate about four days later or so. And this is the end of the embryonic stage. So this is the end of uh, week number eight or the end of two months. This is how a real one looks. All right, after the embryonic stage, we move on to the last portion, uh, the fetal stage. Now the fetus is the end of the eighth week to the birth. So the embryo is only the first two months, and then the fetus is from uh, the end of the eighth week then on. It's from here as we will get very rapid growth and the body proportions uh, change very considerably. And at this stage, the head is really, really large compared to the rest of the uh, fetus's body. Okay. Uh, the top row here is males, the uh, bottom row here is females. See so a two month embryo, head much, much larger compared to the rest of its body. Same thing with the fetus. It's, it's starting to even out a little bit, but it's still disproportionately larger than the rest of the body. And you can tell when you get to adolescence, it's when it kind of evens out completely. All right, at the end of 12 weeks, the fetus is uh, distinguishable as male or female. Now, all fetuses, not just for humans, but all mammals, all fetuses start off as female. And some will turn into males, developing on the presence of uh, testosterone. All external structures, uh, reproductively, correspond to the opposite sex. So that's how you're able to go from one gender or one sex to the opposite gender during a uh, sex change. Uh, for example, what develops initially as a clitoris will turn into a penis for males. What starts off as the labia majora in females will turn into the scrotum for males. Here's a page that kind of shows you the path of all these external structures. That's how we all can start off here. And then if there is no testosterone there, it will continue on as female. If testosterone is there, then these structures will develop into something else for the male. Well, it becomes the, the uh, glans clitoris here actually becomes the glans penis of the male. What's oh, the foreskin of the male is actually the, uh, the hood above the clitoris or around the clitoris for females. Uh, the labia majora here will actually fuse around the testes as they come down uh, the inguinal canal and they fuse together. That's why the you'll see the seam here down the shaft of the penis where the labia majora have fused together. And what are what starts off as the ovaries in females will turn into the testes for males. And they just continue to descend past the pelvic cavity outside of the body into the, through the inguinal canal, which they are enclosed by the scrotum. All right, by the end of the 16, 16 weeks or four months, the fetus will have hair and nails, and the skeleton will begin to or continue to ossify. And at the end of the uh, fifth month or 20 weeks, Muscles are a lot stronger, and the body is covered by a very fine, very downy hair called lanugo. And at the end of 24 weeks, the fetus will gain a large amount of weight, 
and you actually will see eyelashes and eyebrows start to appear. Uh, by the end of the 28th week, uh, fat is deposited within the subcutaneous tissue, and eyelids will begin to reopen. Uh, and the last eight weeks of the stage include the testes of the male descending all the way down throughout the body. Uh, organs become much more specialized, and neurons become a lot more networked with each other. And the last two systems to form in the fetus are the digestive and the respiratory systems. That's why any baby that's born premature almost always has a respiratory issue. That's why they're taken right away to the uh, intensive care, uh, or the neonatal intensive care. So the longer they're able to stay in the uterus and develop, the less issues they're going to have these last two systems. All right, here's a, a table uh, from the book that has all the major events of each stage. You know, the first week is the pre-embryonic stage, or cleavage. The embryonic stage, the second week through the eighth week, and then from the ninth week on is the fetal stage. That's, this slide here has some general information I wanted to cover. Uh, nothing I would ask on a test, but it is interesting, I find. Uh, out of every 100 uh, oocytes that are exposed to sperm, of those 100, only 84 are going to be fertilized. This is on average, of course. And of those 84, only 69 are able to implant in the uterus. It's, it's quite often that women or women will become pregnant and then never know it because that is lost during the next uh, menstrual cycle. So this is because you have a uh, fertilization does automatically mean that you're going to be delivering a baby in nine months. It has to go through a lot of a lot of events has to clear a lot of hurdles in order to implant into the uh, uterine lining and then continue to grow normally. So of those 69 to actually implant, only 42 will survive one week or longer. And of those, you know, 37 will survive six weeks or longer. And of the original 100 that we started with, only 31 are born alive. And that's not assuming any other you know, potential defects. So it's, even though it seems like it happens quite often, the odds are really against you on getting pregnant and going all the way to term. Alright, next, uh, the fetal blood circulation. Due to its environment, uh, the circulation system is very different from the fetus than is in the adult because the fetus sits in a, a fluid-filled sac, you know, the amniotic sac, and the lungs aren't fully developed until right until the very end of pregnancy. So there are structures found in the uh, fetal heart that are not found in the adult heart. Another example of a difference, uh, the hemoglobin of fetal blood has a much greater oxygen carrying capacity compared to an adult because they are developing tissues you know, of all complexity, so they need more oxygen at a higher rate. So the hemoglobin in a fetus carries a lot more oxygen compared to the hemoglobin of an adult. All right. As blood passes from the mother to the fetus nope, through the placenta, <coughs> I'll do this one again. <coughs> I'll get some get it ready here, hang on. <coughs> Alright. <coughs> Alright, as blood passes from the mother to the fetus, you know, via the placenta, then the umbilical vein and then arteries. And these are underlined because they seem opposite of what they should be. Uh, oxygenated blood is carried by the umbilical vein toward the fetal heart, and then the two umbilical arteries carry carbon dioxide and other waste from the fetus to the mother. So don't confuse these two. The umbilical vein carries oxygenated blood for the fetus, and the umbilical arteries carry carbon dioxide and waste from fetus to mom. As that blood enters the fetus, it will continue on, and the first organ it goes through, or the first major organ is the liver, but of that blood only half will continue on to liver. The other half will bypass the liver completely and it does so, does so through a structure called the ductus venosus and it will go right around the liver going right to the inferior vena cava and from there onto the right atrium like normal. So this is the first structure that we'll, we'll talk about that is not found in newborns or adults. This is only in the fetus. So half the blood from mom goes through the liver like it should the other half will continue basically almost around the liver through the ductus venosus going on to inferior vena cava and then right atrium. 
as the blood enters the right atrium, blood can go one of two different routes. Both of them completely bypass the lungs since the lungs aren't fully developed. All right, so we're still talking about the fetus, so in the right atrium. Uh, in one of these pathways, blood can go directly from the right atrium to the left atrium. It's done so by passing through a hole called a foramen ovale. When people talk about a baby uh, being born with having, or having a hole in their heart, this is usually, not always, but usually what this references, uh, the structure that's referenced, the foramen ovale. So some blood will go right from the right atrium directly to the left atrium, to the foramen ovale. And this hole will seal up shortly after the baby is born, probably within 30 to 45 minutes after being born. This hole should, in normal situations, seal up by itself. Alright, that's one pathway the blood could take. In the second pathway, uh, most of the blood will go from the right atrium, the tricuspid valve, right ventricle, and into the pulmonary trunk like you w normally would for an adult. But once you get to the pulmonary trunk, it will skip going to the lungs since they aren't ready yet, and it will enter the uh, a vessel called the ductus arteriosus. From here, blood will connect directly to the aorta. So you're skipping the whole pulmonary, uh, pulmonary circuit. You're going right from the right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, into the pulmonary trunk, ductus arteriosus, and then to the aorta. You're skipping the entire left-hand side of the heart. All right, here's an image of all those structures. No placenta and blood coming in. Some blood goes right through onto the liver, like it should, but some will bypass the liver and go through here, no ductus venosus, and then in, right into the inferior vena cava, and onto the right atrium. Now from here, one of two different routes you can take. Uh, directly from the right atrium to the left atrium, through the uh, ductus, I'm sorry, through the foramen of valley, which is right about here, or it can go right atrium, Cuspid valve, right ventricle, pulmonary trunk, but skipping the lungs entirely, going through the ductus arteriosus, right to the aorta, and then out to the body. So almost all blood at this point is completely bypassing the lungs. All right, here's a summary of, of all those. Uh, of course, the, the the highlights that you want to focus on are the functions: the fetal blood, higher oxygen carrying capacity for the hemoglobin. Uh, umbilical vein carries blood with oxygen. Uh, umbilical arteries carry blood with carbon dioxide. And the three structures we mentioned, and again, these are only found within the fetus. Ductus phenosis, foramen of valley, and ductus arteriosus. Right, here's a comparison between uh, blood in the adult and the fetus. And I made a, a general statement here uh, for adults. Arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart, which is true except for the pulmonary vessels, so we'll just kind of you know, glance over that for now. And normally veins carry non-oxygenated blood toward the heart. An exchange of gases occurs in the lungs, in the alveoli of the lungs. For fetuses, arteries carry non-oxygenated blood away from the fetal heart, and veins carry oxygenated blood back toward the fetal heart. An exchange of gases occurs within the placenta. That's why that's underlined. So for adults, no gas exchange is in the, in the alveoli and the lungs, but for a fetus, all the gas exchange happens within the placenta. All right, uh, the birth process, this is where the pregnancy formally ends. It's called uh, parturition. And as the placenta uh, ages, the concentration of progesterone will get lower and lower and lower. It's at this point that uh, this decline will trigger uh, hormones that will promote the contraction of the uterus. Okay, at this time, uh, the cervix will start to thin and will start to open soon, you know, the dilation of the cervix. Uh, the stretching of the uterine tissues will stimulate the uh, posterior pituitary to release the hormone oxytocin that we talked about a few weeks ago. And this will stimulate even stronger uterine contractions. And these stronger contractions will help move the head of the fetus down toward the cervix and then eventually out. So here's the cycle of what all labor is. You have uh, cervix being stretched, and those stretch receptors are now stimulated. This causes a even stronger uh, contraction by the uterus. So the fetus is moved further down, which causes the head to move toward the cervix, which causes it to stretch more. And this goes on and on and on for hours and hours and hours until the baby is born, or baby is delivered. 
All right, now people who uh, don't have children or don't know anyone with children really get all they know from uh, childbirth from the TV and movies, and they think once the baby is out, you know, they they clean it off and put it in a towel and everything's finished. Well, that's not that's not reality. That's not the case. After the birth of that fetus, the placenta has to also come out. It has to be expelled, and the placenta will actually uh, separate itself from the uterine wall and travel down the birth canal right behind baby. And the expelled placenta is the afterbirth. So if this doesn't come out on its own, it has to be removed from the uterus. So you can't just leave the placenta there. So you're not just delivering baby, you are delivering also the placenta. And here how is how here's how this would look. Of course the baby you know, is starting to come out. And after the baby comes out, you know, it's still attached to the umbilical cord, which is still anchored to the placenta. This is showing it actually starting to pull away or become detached, and that will come out through the vagina also. Around the fifth week of pregnancy, uh, the anterior pituitary will increase production of the hormone prolactin that I mentioned earlier to prepare for the milk production that will be needed for the newborn. Now this first milk, as it's called, is very thin, very watery, and it's also called colostrum. This is very high in antibodies, very high in proteins, but very, very low in carbohydrates and fats. Now this will increase in carbs, increase in fats in a few days when it's, the milk is more mature and it's not called colostrum at that point. So the very beginning milk right after a baby is born is called colostrum. High protein, high antibodies, but very, very low in fats and carbs. Okay, here's a a, a slide of, of breast tissue before uh, development of prolactin and then after. And as the breasts begin to swell in preparation for the baby beginning to nurse, that's why the breast tissue actually will swell. The combination of the prolactin making the milk and a uh, placental lactogen actually enlarging the breast tissue. All right, the postnatal period, remember this is from the minute that the baby is born until that person dies. And it's, this can be divided into uh, various time frames. Uh, the neonatal period, neo means new, so basically a new baby. This is from birth to the end of week four, so the first month of that baby's life is the neonatal period. Uh, infancy, end of that first month to the end of that first year, so fourth week to one year. Uh, childhood, from year one to puberty. Uh, adolescence, from puberty to adulthood. Adulthood, is adolescence to old age. And the last one is called senescence, old age to death. This is another term for something dying, senescence. And of course, all of these will will vary greatly, especially when it comes to adolescence and adulthood and senescence, depending on the person. All right, that brings us to the end of uh, this chapter. Of course, if you have any questions, like always, then please ask or post them to the discussion board on Blackboard.